Before the Second World War, before such aircraft as the Bell P-39 Aerocobra, the Curtis P-40 Warhawk, the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, and the North American P-51 Mustang, there were two aircraft that paved the way for monoplane fighter development in the United States. One was the Curtis P-36, an aircraft already featured on this channel, and which was the direct precursor to the P-40. And the other pioneering monoplane fighter was the Seversky P-35, which is the focus of today's video. Today's video is also very kindly sponsored by Icarus Art, who produce aviation-themed prints and posters. Whether you're into Catalinas, Corsairs, Stukas, Spitfires, or Ansons, there's sure to be a piece that takes your fancy. And, if not, they're constantly adding new designs and art pieces to their collection. You can purchase them as printed canvas or posters, and they come in a variety of sizes to suit your desk space or your office or living room walls. So to check out their collection, click on the link below or go to icarusart.net and use the code REX to get a 10% discount on your order. Now, let's take a closer look at the Seversky P-35. The P-35 can trace its origins back to the SEV-3, which was the first aircraft developed by the recently formed Seversky Aircraft Company. Founded in 1931, it was in fact a revival of the Seversky Aero Corporation, which itself had been founded back in 1923. Now that company had never actually produced an aircraft itself, instead they focused on manufacturing instruments and parts, and it had not been big enough to survive the Wall Street crash of 1929. The SEV-3 was the work of Alexander de Seversky, the company founder, and Alexander Cartvelli, his chief designer. Seversky had a long association with aircraft. He'd served with the Imperial Russian Air Services in the First World War, becoming a flying ace with 13 victories, before fleeing to the States in 1918 to avoid the turmoil of the revolution. Also hailing from Russia, Kartveli was a gifted engineer who had spent most of his professional life living in France, before emigrating to the United States in the late 1920s. His name might be familiar to some viewers of this channel, as Cartvelli's list of aircraft designs includes things such as the P-43 Lancer, the P-47 Thunderbolt, the F-84 Thunderjet, the F-84F Thunderstreak, and the F-105 Thunderchief, just to name a few. But those achievements were, for the moment at least, ahead of him. As far as debut aircraft went, the SEV-3 was quite impressive. It was an amphibious, three-seat, low-wing monoplane that, in a time when biplane amphibians were still the norm, represented a huge upgrade for its class. It was powered by a 420 horsepower Wright J6 Whirlwind, and this, along with its sleek or metal design, allowed Seversky himself to set a new world speed record for the type of 179.7 miles an hour, which was around 289 kilometers an hour. Its performance was good enough that Seversky believed it could easily compete for military contracts. With this in mind, the floats were removed and a pair of fixed main landing gears with aerodynamic spats were installed instead. Redesignated as the SEV-3 XAR, it was then sent to Wright Field to compete in a competition for a new general training aircraft for the Army Air Corps. In 1935 it won the competition, and became the first all-metal, low-wing monoplane trainer selected for US service. Production models were known as the BT-8, and Seversky would end up producing around 30 for the Army Air Corps. In general it was well liked by Army pilots, it was sturdy, reliable, and was easy to take off and land. However there was one glaring issue, and that was it was woefully underpowered. This wasn't a result of the design itself, but an army mandate that all training aircraft should have an engine of no more than 400 horsepower. As such, the BT-8 had been re-engined with a Pratt & Whitney Wasp Jr. To prove that the airframe would be perfectly viable with a much more powerful engine, Seversky modified the original SEV once again. A Wright R1820 Cyclone was installed, rated at around 750 horsepower, and the floats were also reinstalled as well. Alexander Seversky himself then took it upon himself to set yet another world speed record, this time clocking in at 230.4 miles an hour, which was around 370 kilometers an hour, in September of 1935. Unfortunately, an upgraded version of the Seversky BT-8 would not be produced. 
by the time the BT-8s were entering service in 1936, the prototype for what would become the North American BT-9 had already flown. This aircraft, the forerunner to the famous T-6 Texan, would quickly go on to replace the BT-8 in the latter parts of the 1930s. However, buoyed by the improved performance of the SEB-3, Seversky built a second aircraft, specifically to enter in a new pursuit fighter competition that had been opened by the Army in 1935. The SEV-2 XP was basically a land plane version of the upgraded SEB-3 with a fixed landing gear. It inherited the aerodynamic spats from the SEV-3 land plane, and it mounted three machine guns a 50 caliber and a 30 caliber weapon in the nose, and a 30 caliber in the rear for defense as well. Built as a two-man aircraft in a time when the single cockpit fighter was the norm, and not looking like the sleekest aircraft around either, it was perhaps a little strange that Seversky felt confident of winning the upcoming competition. Luckily for Seversky, the prototype aircraft was damaged en route to the proving ground at Wright Field. I say luckily because, during this time, Curtis Wright had unveiled their prototype for the Model 75 Hawk, which would have completely dominated Seversky's entry in the competition and led to some serious embarrassment. Owing to the damaged prototype, the competition was delayed, allowing Seversky and Cart Valley to carry out repairs. They also carried out an extensive redesign, having now seen what the competition actually was. Retaining the wing and engine, the fuselage was modified to have a single-seat cockpit with a razorback spine, something that would become a bit of a hallmark for Cart Valley designs moving forward. And the fixed landing gear was replaced by a rearward retracting landing gear, with fairings that completely enclosed the mechanism and wheels. This not only dramatically improved the streamlining of the aircraft, but it would also act as a slight buffer in a wheels-up landing, with the fairings taking the worst of the impact before the fuselage made contact with the ground. With said modifications made, the aircraft was redesignated yet again as the SEV-1XP, and it returned to Wright Field to take part in the competition in late 1935. Curtis Wright then immediately complained that the Seversky model had been improved upon, rather than just repaired, and they demanded that the competition be delayed again so that they could make modifications to their prototype as well. Fast forward to early 1936, and both sides had finally stopped complaining for long enough that the army could actually get on with things, and then the army immediately complicated matters by stipulating a change in power plant. One of the conditions of the competition had been a top speed in excess of 300 miles an hour, and thus far neither aircraft had achieved this. One problem had been reliability issues with the early versions of the Wright Cyclone, which were failing to produce their advertised horsepower, and the Army pushed for a change to the Pratt & Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp, which promised to deliver upwards of 850 horsepower. This turned out to be something of an exercise in futility, as, as it turned out, the engine barely managed to produce 750 horsepower on a good day, rather than 850, and during the final tests of the competition, the Seversky prototype only achieved a top speed of 277 miles an hour, which was over 10 miles an hour slower than when it was running with the right Cyclone engine instead. That being said, the Curtis prototype was faring even worse with the engine change, and although the top speed requirement wasn't met by either aircraft, Seversky was awarded a contract to produce 77 fighters as the P-35. The production P-35 differed from the prototype in a number of ways. Firstly, it had a more powerful engine, the 950 horsepower R1830-9 version of the Twin Wasp, a version that actually produced its advertised horsepower for a change. The carburetor intake was moved from the upper cowling to a position on the side of the fuselage where it met with the wing. The landing gear fairings were reduced in coverage to save weight, although they were still useful in a wheels-up landing situation. The shotgun shell starting system was replaced with an all-electric starter, and the bulged canopy was replaced with a more streamlined design. Following these changes, the specifications of the P-35 were as follows. The wingspan was of 36 feet, or around 11 meters. It had a length of 25 feet 2 inches, or 7.7 meters, and a height of 9 feet 1 inch, or 2.76 meters. 
It had a maximum weight of around 5,600 pounds, or 2.5 tons, and it had a slightly improved top speed of 281 miles an hour, or around 452 kilometers an hour. The armament remained the same, one 30 caliber gun and one 50 caliber gun being in the nose, but a standout feature of the P-35 was its deeply impressive range of over 1,100 miles. This was thanks to the innovative use of a so-called wet wing, which represented a fair amount of foresight on the part of Alexander Kartveli. The entire inner structure of the wing was coated with a special sealant, which made the entire thing into a large, single fuel tank, which gave the P-35 a very long range. US aerial doctrine at the time didn't put the greatest emphasis on range, as most fighter aircraft were designed to be used for coastal defense, rather than, you know, things like the long-range escort or intercept missions you'd be seeing in the Second World War, and there were also the vast distances of the Pacific to consider as well, and a lot of the time that wasn't really being factored into a fighter design in the US, especially with the Army Air Corps. The, the Navy had it considered a bit more, but for the Army, this was a considerable departure to have an aircraft with such a long range. But because of the Army's sort of doctrinal thinking at the time, the superior range of the P-35 was not as appreciated at the time as what it could have been, though this may have also something to do with the fact that the wet wing was a complete nightmare from the point of maintenance. The sealant in the wing dried out rather quickly, which resulted in minor, and then <laughs> not so minor, fuel leaks. This meant that the wing had to be disassembled at regular intervals to get at the problem, lest the P-35 become a flying sieve, and this was a time-consuming and very costly addition to the aircraft's regular maintenance cycle. Putting aside the proclivity to distribute aviation fuel across various parts of the US mainland, the Caribbean and Pacific waters, when it entered service in 1937, the P-35 was the first fighter aircraft in the US to incorporate all of the modern features that would soon become the norm in a fighter in World War II. A cantilever monoplane wing, all metal construction, a fully enclosed cockpit, and a retractable main landing gear. In essence, it was a huge upgrade when compared to anything else that had come before, and indeed, the most modern fighter in the frontline service at the time was the Boeing P-26 P-Shooter, which featured a fixed landing gear, an open cockpit, and externally braced wings. The first squadrons to receive the P-35 were those of the 1st Pursuit Group, which were based at Selfridge Field in Michigan. It was an easy aircraft to learn, being rugged and quite forgiving on rough landings, but in general it did not earn a particularly good reputation with the US pilots. It was often viewed as being underpowered, and the constant fuel leaks from the wet wing made it public enemy number one for most of the squadron's ground crews. This and the fact that delivery of all 77 aircraft took well over a year to complete contributed to the Air Corps placing a larger order for the Curtis P-36 Hawk, the aircraft that the P-35 had initially beaten out in the competition. However, another contributing factor may have been Alexander Seversky's poor political slash business decisions. In parallel with the P-35, a two-seat version known as the A-12, or 2PA, or A-8V-1, depending on which exact model and country you're looking at, had been developed. There is a bit of a debate as to whether this was developed from the original two-seat fighter prototype, the SEV-XP-2, or if this was a separate two-seat model. But either way, ostensibly, it was designed as a light bomber. It only saw use as a trainer within the Air Corps, but it did receive some foreign interest. Now, this foreign interest included the somewhat under-the-counter sale of 20 of these aircraft to Imperial Japan in 1937, which, considering the political climate of the time, rather annoyed several prominent people within the US military and various government offices. Funny that... This meant that for a time, both America and Japan would essentially field one version or another of the P-35 in their air units. However, the Japanese would not use them in a combat role by the time they were at war in the Pacific. They did see some action in the Sino-Japanese conflict, but by the time of Pearl Harbor, they had been relegated as training aircraft. 
But getting back to Seversky, as a result of that sale and a slew of whole other things, no further orders for the P-35 were forthcoming, and following the Air Corps' expansion program in 1940, the P-35s in service were simply split across the various pursuit groups to plug gaps until better fighters could be delivered. This would either come in the form of the improved variants of the P-36, which didn't suffer from their earlier self-immolating exhaust problems, or, more hopefully, the shiny new Curtiss P-40 Warhawk. Now this left Seversky and the company in a bit of an embarrassing position, for they had invested a lot of money in the P-35 and their production lines, and they suddenly had very little to show for it. Additionally, the company was also in a fair amount of debt owing to production costs, and Seversky's gallivanting around the country building racing models of the P-35, which were great for publicity but didn't really earn them much in the way of money. Thankfully, two things came to the rescue. Sweden, and then an internal business-slash-hostile takeover. In 1939, with the imminent threat of war looming, the Swedish Air Force was looking to overseas aircraft suppliers to help modernise its inventory. Their own domestic production of aircraft was slowly getting up to speed, but Saab had yet gotten to the point where it could build true fighters on its own, and so one of the big things Sweden was looking for was a modern fighter to replace the biplanes that they were currently fielding. One of the many aircraft that took Swedish attention was the Seversky P-35. Alexander Seversky immediately jumped on the opportunity, and he took personal charge of the effort to secure the Swedish order, and this involved producing a more powerful and updated version of the P-35. Now, in the previous two years, Seversky had pursued a fairly successful racing program, building multiple fast aircraft based on the P-35 airframe. Didn't always make them a lot of money, but from the standpoint of speed, performance and racing, they were successful. During this time, several experimental aircraft were also produced, such as the AP-1, the AP-4, and the AP-7, with the letters standing for Army Pursuit, though, with the exception of the AP-4, little attention was actually paid to them by the Army at all. The AP-7 was used by female aviator Jackie Cochran to set several new records, including one for 320 miles an hour over a 2,000 mile circuit, and it was this aircraft that became the basis for the new P-35A. Known internally as the EP-168, with the EP standing for Export Pursuit, the aircraft had a slightly lengthened fuselage, a longer air scoop, and it had an improved armament. It had two 30 caliber machine guns in the nose, and two 50 caliber machine guns mounted in the wings. To deal with the added weight, the aircraft also came with a beefed up version of the Twin Wasp, which now put out around 1200 horsepower. Aside from the longer fuselage, these aircraft were easily identified by the fairings installed underneath the wing mounted machine guns. The wings themselves were too thin to safely catch the spent bullet casings, owing to the wet wing fuel tank style, so a streamlined compartment had to be installed underneath. Sweden placed an initial order for 15 aircraft on the 29th of June 1939, and this was quickly followed by another for 45 aircraft in October, and then one more for a further 60 aircraft in January of 1940. However, by this point, there had been a big change. Sweden was no longer receiving Seversky aircraft, they were instead receiving those from the newly renamed Republic Aviation Corporation. A combination of financial loss and political intrigue, a topic of which is beyond the scope of this video, had led to a major restructure of the company, and Alexander Seversky had been forced out of the company he had founded and the name change was part of an attempt to fix partially burned bridges with the US government. Deliveries of the Republic aircraft began in early 1940, receiving the Swedish designation of J-9. By mid-1940, the first 60 of these had been delivered, coming by sea to Trondheim in Norway, and then completing the rest of the journey by rail, but the second batch of aircraft would never make it across the Atlantic. With the ever-increasing prospect of the United States being dragged into a war in Europe, the War Department had impressed a number of aircraft on the production lines that had been purchased by other nations, and the Swedish P-35s were one of their victims. The J-9s that had made it across to Sweden would go on to lead relatively long service lives. Indeed, they served the longest out of all the P-35s that were actually built. 
Defending Sweden's neutrality, the J-9s flew throughout the Second World War, often intercepting Allied bombers that had been forced to flee across into Swedish airspace after sustaining damage over Germany. They remained in frontline service for a long time, being frontline fighter aircraft until 1947, and several were still in use in the mid-1950s, including two that were often flown by air staff on inspection tours. In fact, two of the surviving four P-35s are from the Swedish order, one of which can be found in Sweden itself, and the other one is currently under restoration in Florida. Back over in the United States, the remaining P-35As that were on the production line were rapidly placed into service throughout 1940 and early 1941. Though they were being thoroughly outclassed by emerging designs such as the Lockheed P-38, the Bell P-39, and of course the Curtis P-40, these newer models were not always available in sufficient numbers for the rapidly expanding air groups of the Army Air Corps at the time. This was especially true for the more remote air units, particularly those based in the Philippines, who were in desperate need of more modern fighters. The need was in fact so urgent that 45 P-35s were taken straight off the production line as is and sent across the Pacific to the Philippines. They arrived there with Swedish insignia, Swedish flight manuals, and metric flying instruments, none of which made them particularly easy to adjust to, and it took a considerable amount of time for everything to be put back to normal. Initially, these P-35s were assigned to all of the squadrons within the 24th Pursuit Group that was based at Clark Air Base. Along with Curtis P-36s, and even a number of older P-26P shooters, they formed the bulk of the Philippines' air defences in the lead-up to the Pacific War. Now, by the time of December the 8th itself had actually come around in 1941, newer P-40 Warhawks were arriving, but a large number of the P-35As still equipped the 34th Pursuit Squadron, which was based at Carmen Field. It was these aircraft that would make the Type's combat debut, if you could call the loss of 12 P-35s on the ground as such a thing, but other P-35s were soon in the air for the frantic and desperate defence against the Japanese onslaught. As with the Curtis P-36 and early models of the P-40s, the P-35s suffered due to a lack of effective protection. They possessed no armour for the pilot whatsoever, and the fuel tanks were not self-sealing. Indeed, some of the P-35s were already quite worn out, and the wet wings apparently leaked abominably by this point, with at least one aircraft being lost to a mid-air fire, as the leaking fuel was literally ignited by either gunfire or simply the hot exhaust of the aircraft's engine. Now, depending on what source material you read, the P-35 may have shot down two Mitsubishi A6M0s. However, kill claims for this early chaotic part of the war are very difficult to substantiate. The two claimed kills against Zeros were made by Lieutenants Stuart Robb and Ben Brown, both flying with the 34th Pursuit Squadron. But even if both of those victories did in fact take place, they would have been an anomaly in an otherwise grim situation for the P-35s in the Philippines. By the 10th of December, just two days into the fighting, their numbers had dwindled from 45 airframes down to just 16. These were then thrown into the attack on the oncoming Japanese invasion fleet, where one P-35, flown by a Lieutenant Sam Morritt, repeatedly strafed and eventually sank the Japanese minesweeper W-10, making it the type's only naval kill. Unfortunately, Morritt himself would be killed in the attempt, as when the minesweeper went up, the explosion was that powerful, and the aircraft was that low, that the shockwave literally tore one of the wings off, and his P-35 was seen plummeting into the sea. Following the attack on the invasion fleet, more ill fortune soon followed. The same group of fighters that had gone out for the attack was caught by another wave of Japanese aircraft as they returned to their airbase in the afternoon to rearm and refuel. The result was 12 more P-35s being destroyed and a further 6 were damaged. By the 24th of December, just six P-35s were still operational in the area, and they were then ordered to pull back to Bataan Field on the 6th of January 1942. In a cruel sense of irony, they were then mistaken for Japanese aircraft by the understandably anxious and somewhat trigger-happy US anti-aircraft gunners defending the airfield, 
and at least two of those six P-35s were brought down or written off by friendly fire. The last actual combat sortie flown by the P-35 involved the last remaining aircraft on the 3rd of May, when Captain Ramon Zosa of the Philippine Army Air Corps carried out a strafing attack on the Japanese landings. Following this, he landed the aircraft in a small jungle airstrip, and the P-35's brief and bloody combat life came to a sudden end. Though all of the P-35s in the Philippines had been wiped out, it's important to note that a vast majority of them were actually brought down either by Japanese, or unfortunately friendly, ground fire. Only a small number were actually lost in air-to-air -air combat, so assessing its capabilities as a frontline fighter leaves a lot for interpretation. However, it was plain enough that it was simply no match for the opposition. Like many designs of its time, the P-35 was innovative one year, and then almost totally obsolete the next, with fatal consequences for the men that would go on to fly it. That being said, aside from the issues with the wet wing, the P-35 itself wasn't necessarily a bad aircraft. It handled well, and the rest of it was easy to maintain, aside from the wet wing, it just wasn't good enough by the time that it got a chance for real action. This obsolescence had long been anticipated as far back as 1939, and steps had been taken to improve upon the design, and this had resulted in several experimental aircraft designs, two of which are of particular note. The first was the XP-41. Now, the last P-35 off the production line was kept back and modified, being equipped with a 1200 horsepower twin WASP engine with a new two-stage supercharger. The supercharger was mounted in a ventral position under the fuselage, and the landing gear now retracted inward rather than rearward. This aircraft flew for the first time in March of 1939, and it set a top speed of 323 miles an hour. However, development of the XP-41 would quickly stop due to the development of another prototype. This second aircraft came with an even more potent engine, the Pratt & Whitney 1830-25. Now this aircraft produced the same horsepower as the XP-41, but it came with a turbo supercharger. This allowed it to perform much better at higher altitudes, and although this new fighter was heavier, it was in fact faster, clocking in at 351 miles an hour on its demonstration flight. With these impressive performance figures in hand, it was entered into the 1939 fighter competition for the Army Air Corps, and it won. Seversky, soon to become Republic, was then given a contract to produce this fighter as the P-43 Lancer. But the story of a Lancer is one for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons. I apologise if I sound a little bit out of it today, I'm recovering from a cold that I picked up on the flight coming back from England, and that has not been fun to deal with in any way, shape or form. We should see some more long form videos again coming soon, I know some people have been asking, you know, what's with all the short videos? It's because I've been away and I just haven't had time to record the really long ones because it's a multi-day affair, otherwise I lose my voice. But the long videos are coming back, don't panic. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a big thank you to just everyone in general on Patreon who voted on the video format poll that I put up the other day. All of your feedback has been fantastic, and with that, I will be able to make some better plans for the future. But for now, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.